Hi, everyone, and welcome to From Chaos to Clarity. I am Eric Abel. I'll be your host for today, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing for WalkMe. Over the last year or so, I've had the chance to work with our customers and product management, account teams, to make sure that data is at the heart of every digital adoption strategy. And I think it's particularly important today because of our current economic state, there's a lot of pressure being put on software investments and really ensuring that every application that you have has a place inside the organization. But one of the key challenges we'll talk about is the challenge of visibility. Enterprises today have visibility into less than half of their enterprise tech stack. And that makes it really hard to act on that data. So we'll talk about some of these current challenges and share some success stories from our customer, Cisco, who's joined us. Thank you to, to uh, Cisco. And before we get started, uh, just a couple, a couple notes about the webinar. We'd love to invite your participation. Please do drop your questions in the chat. We'll have a live Q&A following where we'll go through all of that. And then for those that are joining us here today, you'll get a recording after, after this event. So please look out for that. With that said, I'd love to get started and love to introduce our guest for today, Diane Hinchcliffe, VP and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research and Stephanie Zarabian, Sales Enablement Insights and Innovation at Cisco. Dion, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Could you start us off by introducing yourself and telling us a bit about your areas of expertise? Uh, sure, Eric, and thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, so yes, I work primarily with our Chief Information Officer audience, so CIOs. Uh, those are the, the folks uh, in our organizations that are in charge of IT and our systems, or at least they're supposed to be. Uh, we find that uh, shadow IT has, uh, in my research has, research, has grown from 10% of the IT portfolio to over half of uh, of IT today. And so it's really difficult to, you know, for IT organizations today to get their arms around this challenge. And I work primarily with large Fortune 500 Global 2000 firms uh, and the very complex portfolios of IT that they have. Uh, organizations in the Fortune 500 have between 500 and 3,000 applications that run the business, and they, they maintain constant spreadsheets trying to understand what they have and what they're, what, you know, rationalizing that, that immense IT portfolio. And that's primarily where I work on is advising CIOs on managing that IT portfolio, on transforming it into what they need it to be in the future, so digital transformation. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's a fascinating and, and challenging time, but it's also very rewarding to work with these these folks that are helping build the, the future of the organization. And Stephanie, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Could you tell us about yourself, your role at Cisco, your experience with digital adoption? Absolutely. So I've been with Cisco for about 18 months now, and I was brought in specifically to implement different enablement programs with WalkMe at Cisco. We currently had WalkMe used for operational and release management and change management, um, purposes in our operations org, but we really wanted to use it for more enablement, for reaching sellers within the flow of work, for intercepting poor behaviors and reinforcing good behaviors. Long past traditional enablement programs have ended. And it's a really exciting time to be at Cisco. Cisco is the sixth company where I've implemented WalkMe programs. It's been an incredible journey and I've had incredible experiences at each company. I feel like it's all kind of culminated to helping Cisco go through this major transformation that they're driving um, over the next few years. All right, let's dive in. Dion, can you tell us a little bit about the state of digital transformation today? Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, it's a topic that I've been involved in for quite some time and organizations uh, are typically five or 10 years into this journey already. So it's something that's been happening for a while. Um, and you know, organizations are looking at uh, everything that they're doing and trying to understand how can they move themselves into the future. And, and uh, usually chief information officers have the largest share of responsibility for, for bringing their organizations forward and uh, carrying out that transformation. Uh, the challenge is the, the massive investments that are required to do this. Um, you know, if you look at the number of applications, the number of systems that have to change, uh, and we look at um, the, the data of where organizations are in terms of the actual state 
uh, for, for most of them. Um, we survey our CIOs and our chief digital officers fairly often, and we've also worked with others like uh, uh, Harvard, uh, who's, uh, who did a massive digital transformation survey last year. And what we find is that although many of them have had digital transformation efforts for some years now, gone through the process several times, um, they're, they're, they're moving slowly. Um, they're not making a lot of progress. And when the rate of change inside your organization is slower than the rate of change outside your organization, that is a significant issue. Uh, organizations need to move faster uh, as they carry out digital change and as they try and modernize. We add all the, the challenges in just making those changes to the economic pressure that CIOs are now facing to, to, to justify the continued investments. Uh, the Harvard study that, that came out last year um, found that um, it takes six to 10 years for organizations to typically see real results. And that's just too long. Uh, and so, there, you know, there's you know, many factors that have led to the tech sprawl that we see. There's, there's a lot of systems that require to be updated and, and rethought uh, to address new business models and new markets. Um, and th that tech sprawl isn't a bad thing. We want all this IT. Uh, everyone wants to automate their corner of the business. Everyone wants to, to, to modernize their, their part of the organization. Um, but you know, how can we get to this more holistic view of what we have and what we're doing? That's that's uh, you know, really essential for organizations to move more quicker, uh, more quickly. They have to have that insight. Uh, and so we're seeing this shift from IT managed um, systems to more business managed systems. Decentralization is a real thing. It's a it's a broad trend. We see this in a lot of organizations uh, that IT is in charge of core systems and the business is in charge of a lot of the other ones and maybe even some of the core systems too. And there's also been a shift to virtual and remote work styles and collaboration um, that has um, complicated the IT landscape. It's uh, created a lot more choice and, and variety in the systems that are being used, some for hybrid workers, some for remote workers, some for only in office workers. Uh, and there, there has been an overall shift from legacy applications um, to software as a service. So uh, everything up in the cloud. And so what we really want is to address the, the, the overlap of all of these technologies uh, and the inherent waste that you see in a lot of it. So I see duplication all the time. One of my favorite conversations I had was just uh, last year with a CIO. The, 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 the benchmark question I usually ask is how many ERP systems do you have? And it was the largest number I'd ever heard so far. It keeps going up year after year. It was 33 different ERP systems. And we see the same duplication in CRM and in collaboration tools and, and elsewhere. And organizations aren't even fully aware of it. And so just to even move quickly, we need to, we, we need to simplify the landscape. And so that, that's, um, you know, simple, uh, simplification drives the ability to tackle more, more complexity. That's basically the state of today. Well, certainly in these ec economic times now, they're taking a harder look at their software investments. So what would you say are the challenges for a CIO or a digital leader that's that's looking to achieve that, that optimization because of what's happening in the economy? So the, one of the hardest things to do because the technology landscape is so complicated is to understand ground truth. So you can't manage what you're not measuring, what you can't see. And the, so one of the, the biggest challenge I see CIOs having is just really getting a, a real sense of what's actually happening. And we're still doing, still doing things like auditing departmental credit cards to find out what we have, right? What are people spending the, their money on? We can't actually see it. Um, and without that, we can't actually include it in our modernization plans. We can't include it in our digital transformation efforts because it's not on our radar and we can't manage it. We, we you can't get out ahead of it. Uh, you can't plan for it. And so I would say it's it's that visibility, it's that ground truth is one of the biggest challenges that CIOs have today. And Stephanie, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Could you tell us a little bit about your role at Cisco and your experience with digital adoption? Absolutely. So Cisco is the sixth company where I've implemented a digital adoption platform. It's been a wild ride over the past couple of years, and I was brought to Cisco specifically to implement digital adoption platforms across our entire tech stack as we grow and as we try and take new products to market. It's a really exciting time at Cisco right now where we're going through our own digital transformation as an organization, as we're also helping our sales teams go through digital transformation. 
So taking new products and services to market, growing our portfolio as an organization, and making sure that our sellers and our operations team and everybody across the board has the infrastructure and technical architecture set up so that they can actually meet our revenue goals and help us grow as a company. Great. So Stephanie, considering everything that Dion has, has just shared, I'd love to hear more about what you're seeing at Cisco. What are the most pressing on the ground challenges facing Cisco today when it comes to maximizing the value of, of your software investments? When I joined um, back in early 2021, you know, everything was in hyper growth mode. Um, COVID had ended. We were all ready to get back on the ground running. It was the great resignation. So individuals were coming in and out. Um, even at a company with extensive tenure like Cisco, we still saw a huge influx of new sellers, a huge influx of new um, operational and support people. And at the same time, we were really trying to transition as a company. And the big priorities that we saw were definitely um, how to just increase awareness in the field around new updates. So making sure that they knew um, new platforms were coming, new products, new services were coming, and also how to execute that across their tech stack and making sure that they really got the value out of that. Another thing that we noticed as the months went on <laughs> is that unfortunately, um, you know, the economy wasn't doing as well as we thought. And so the conversation really shifted quickly last year around how can we save as much money as possible, save as many jobs, but still be competitive in the market. And a lot of that um, was around, you know, what are we currently spending our money on? How are our employees currently using their software? Are they getting the value out of it? And if not, what can we cut down so we're not overspending? Thanks, Stephanie. Dion, can you walk us through a, a couple examples of what enterprises are, are doing to get the visibility that, that you mentioned is so important to be able to, to understand how their employees are utilizing this software, see the ROI, see where the gaps are, where they can optimize? What, what, are, they, what are they doing today? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, to frame it all up, we, we have to talk about really one of the, the most significant trends in IT right now. And you talked about uh, uh, visibility, uh, but in, in IT, we're calling that that process observability uh, and, and being able to look into our systems and see what's actually happening. And there's there's been a, a whole cottage industry and uh, uh, around this has developed over the last few years and a lot of exciting startups. Uh, but they're really focusing on the technical observability of our IT systems. They don't really explain to us what, what users are doing. And so we now see the second wave of something called applied observability that really is much more at the business level of the process. Because I, I can share two high level examples uh, of what we've been seeing up until recently, because still for most organizations, they're handling this in a very crude manner. We haven't had precise tools that let, let us see into our, what's actually happening and then act effectively. And so uh, it was a couple of years ago, I, I was uh, working with a CIO who was under a lot of pressure to cut costs suddenly. Um, but when they looked at that massive spreadsheet, that big inventory that they, they had, they're like, well, what, what are people actually using? What's important? What features, what, we, what even what tiers are we using in these systems that we're maybe paying for that we don't actually need? Um, uh, and they had to resort to things like turning off applications that they suspected people weren't using very much or blocking them to see what would happen, right? If they felt it wasn't mission critical to the business, that's the, and we're talking about a very large, well-managed organization, well-known brand. Um, and this is the level of, of, of um, this was a state of the art until recently. We just haven't had the tools. And so that's, that's an example of what not to do. We have these more precise tools now that give us that insight. Uh, another story um, I had is when um, I worked for the CTO of a major um, technology product company, and they were having a hard time getting adoption, getting effective use of their own system with their customers. They, they weren't using the, the, the new capabilities of the system hardly at all, even though the product team had spent a tremendous amount of time working on uh, delivering that. And so uh, after many, they tried many things, they reached out to me and I said, well, here's what I would suggest. Let's go ahead and take the analytics from the application and let's show what people are using, how many people are used, which features and when that day. Let's get a big monitor, put it up in the development room and they can actually see day to day with each rollout, uh, are they able to get those numbers up? Can they start changing? Can they do A-B testing? Can they get in there and actually make it work? And with that data, now that they actually could see what people were doing or not doing, they can change what they did. 
And that made all the difference. And a product grew from, they, they were, couldn't get more than a couple thousand users today. So they were getting hundreds of thousands of users because they were actually managing to data, managing to reality, which is something still in IT we can't do today. So it doesn't matter if it's inside your organization or outside your organization, applied observability at the business level is absolutely critical. Um, and if you want to start looking at you know, your real cost then and saying, where do I have revenue leaks? Um, how can I rationalize my software portfolio based on what we actually use? Uh, you know, and which tier of those products do we actually have? Can we go down? If we find that only a few people are using a couple very expensive features, you can actually see that. And it goes from being this monumental task to being something straightforward you can just do operationally every day. Uh, and this gives you data to go to business owners across the organization. Um, it prevents you from having to analyze all this different data. Uh, you know, the technical observability is, is really popular right now, but it still generates all these different log files from all these different systems. What if you had a better way to more consistently look um, at all of, of your, your sources of, of, of usability inside uh, your organization and really understand the, the people cost, the, the product cost, um, and eliminate the, the cost of, of, frankly, this effort requires, if you're doing this without the right infrastructure, you're gonna spend an enormous amount on consultants and other support that will actually take all those technical files, log files, and actually tell you what you need to know versus just having a business level view. So that's that's really what I'm kind of what I'm seeing. We're, we're entering this kind of this new era um, that's really gonna help us. Thanks, Dion. So, so you, you touched on a key point, I think, which is, you know, where do you go when you see those inefficiencies? And, and that's where I, I'd, I'd love to bring digital adoption into the, the fold here. And, and Stephanie, so as a very early adopter of, of digital adoption platforms, how, how would you say that digital adoption has evolved? And um, what, what's the what's the role of, of data and in, in analytics in that journey that you've had? I think when most people get their hands on a digital adoption platform, they automatically, you know, push it to the learning and development team and say, this is our new textbook. <laughs> you know, Walk Me will just take the place of all of our training. And I think that that's a great first step of when I see digital adoption programs truly maturing, they really move away from you know, release management or you know, the very simplistic um, guided, guided tours that can be um, used with Walk Me. And they really dive into the insights that are available. Um, to be more prescriptive. That's really what I want to be as an enablement professional and as a, as a data first professional is the fact that I want to be the one who shows up to the team with the team meeting with data. I want to be the one that says, actually, <laughs> that's not what's happening in the platform or that's not um, what I, that's not what the data is telling me and base any sort of enablement program or employee experience or UX designs based on what the data is currently telling me. So I think that as you grow your digital adoption platform, of course, continue to use it for the incredible tools like um, you know, step-by-step -step smart walkthroughs, smart tips and things like that. But um, when you really wanna take it to the next level, um, both as a digital adoption professional and as an organization, you really need to start diving into that user data and really getting as much information on your users as you possibly can. Thanks. So uh, at, at the top of the webinar, I, I mentioned that we would be discussing Walk Me Discovery. And so this is the, the latest innovation that we, we've brought to market now. And it's, it's really about helping enterprise IT leaders and software owners that are under pressure because of the economy today to rationalize this portfolio, find ways to optimize their investments. And so, you know, with this capability now, we are taking a leap forward to in, enable this visibility in, into the enterprise tech stack with, with insights into those inefficiencies, like what you called out, Dion, um, in, in software adoption and, and also the, the costs that are behind them. So Stephanie, as um, one, of, one of our uh, power, uh, power users of, of discovery and, and some of the great work that you've done, what what are some of the immediate challenges that you're addressing and, and how are stakeholders reacting to this new data set that you're bringing to the table? It's really exciting. So there's a few things that I've been trying to do with Walk Me Discovery. Um, supporting global sales, there's over 22,000 people in our sales organization. It is massive. 
Um, and that doesn't even include our partners or, you know, the CX side as we move into revenue enablement. But one thing that I've been looking at is what does a day in the life of a seller really look like at Cisco? You know, where are they going on a daily basis? Where are they going multiple times? And the great thing about discovery is that it shows us, <laughs> it tells us, are they going to our own internal website to look at competitive intelligence? Or are they going to chat GPT and typing things in maybe, which is a little bit scary to think about. And really just being able to inform different stakeholders, um, different platform owners and different sales managers about what a day in the life of a seller really does look like. Um, another real critical initiative is, you know, I was asked a couple of months ago to try and find some spare cash. I was looking at couch cushions because we needed to fund different programs. And so one thing I've been looking at is, you know, where could we really trim the fat and where can we see how many licenses we have versus how many people are actually using them on a daily basis? We currently have a program that's launching that is increasing our number of licenses, but the data is telling me that our sellers weren't actually using the amount of licenses we had before. It was you know, an incredibly low percentage in the teens. And so why are we investing this extra money into more licenses and more and, and not using that money um, in different places? So it's really interesting when you come to the table with this sort of data, people aren't used to having it. I think in the past, um, you know, especially with third party vendors, it's you get the data that they deign your admin to have. But now it really kind of removes any sort of um, any sort of blockers that we have into our user user data and keeps our vendors honest as well. So it's it's really really great data to have. Thanks so so much, Stephanie. So um, just you know, final thought on the topic. What what advice would you give to others that are looking for this uh, this this level of visibility in in terms of how uh, how you would guide them with looking at discovery? The, the person with the data is the smartest person in the room because it's objective. There's no politics behind it. You're literally coming there with objective information about how your employees or how your customers are performing. And it's very interesting to see the different gaps in what people say versus what's on, on these data sheets and what's in, um, what's in that console. So I would recommend to do it to upskill yourselves as enablement pro professionals, HR um, partners, or wherever you sit within your organization and truly become a strategic partner by having that level of information into your organization and really using that to um, be very prescriptive and to inform um, future purchases or, uh, or different budget cuts in the future. Thanks so much, Stephanie. It's it's really great to, to be with you today uh, again. So Dion, Turning back to you, um, you've seen Walk Me to Discovery in action. And so considering the, the visibility we've been discussing for successful portfolio rationalization, what limitations do you see with some of the other technologies that are out there addressing this? And, and then what opportunity do you see for Discovery to fill those in, in the market? Sure. Well, I mean, I think um, you know, the key point to understand is if you're trying to optimize your technology stack and, and the purpose of that stack is to serve your stakeholders uh, and, and you want them to be able to get value out, out, out of the systems that you're providing and all those systems work differently they all run in different sets of technologies they all generate their own technology footprints and log files and things to look at and before um, platforms like discovery uh, the challenge was cobbling together this, this consistent vision. It, you're not coming in at the right level of abstraction is what we would say from a technical perspective. Um, and, and, and so you can't get that deep understanding of the context of user behaviors to make the right decisions. So you've got, uh, you, you don't know what paths they're taking. Um, you, you don't know what behavior they have. Uh, and you can't look at it across app applications, for, for example. Um, you can't look at it consistently uh, across all the different silos that you have. So silos still remain a, a, a significant issue, especially as we keep adding more and more IT. So, you know, I look at discovery as being one side of a very of, of a coin that's really important in terms of driving the next level of performance from IT. So that that's applied observability is what, what discovery gives you. Uh, and it gives you the insights to take action. And then Walk, walk Me, platforms like Walk Me, uh, the digital adoption tools allow you to put the pathway support, the enablement, the guardrails if necessary, 
uh, to, to make sure workers are, are moving are working quickly and productively um, and getting the most out of their applications. So you need to have both pieces of uh, pieces of that, both sides of that coin, right? So it, because it's, you can't focus on the things that really matter uh, when you when you have everything in just fragmented pieces. So the, the view has been very limited. You know, I was talking about CIOs turning off applications to find out what's being used. That's insane. And that's probably legacy applications in particular. Um, but understanding the cost. So, you know, you have se seven Salesforce instances. Wouldn't you love to know that one of them is not being used hardly at all, right? Maybe people log in and look at their opportunities, but they don't do anything else. Uh, maybe you don't need that. Maybe someone can build a dashboard on top of that and you can get rid of, you know, one or two of your entire, uh, entirely uh, low utilized Salesforce instances. So that's just an example, but it's a common one. I run into that all the time. Um, and so you, you get an understanding of what you really have what is really being used and what you don't need. Uh, and that, and being able to show data to you know, who you're licensing uh, these products from and say, here's what's really going on with me. I need you to reflect the, the, the cost of the subscriptions to reflect what we're really using. Uh, and so that, that power of truth is really important. Um, and you know, to, be, to be honest uh, as well, many of these applications have administration consoles and analytics that will tell you some pieces of information but how do you know it is really accurate, that it is not biased in their favor, um, that it tells you what you really need to know, what's important versus what they actually show you. So they might just show you when people, how many people log in uh, that day and, that, and maybe some high level stats, but they don't tell you what's really happening from, from, the, from your business perspective. And so having that information gives you that, that full picture. Uh, and that's what things like platforms like Discovery bring to the table. And then things like risk, you know, um, Stephanie mentioned uh, chat GPT, which is all the rage uh, this year. Uh, generative AI uh, is, is, is being used a lot. Where the data says that it's being adopted quite quickly uh, as, a sh as shadow IT by a lot of workers. And that entails risk, uh, you know, company information going into generative AI, which is enormously powerful. It's here to stay. Um, but ensuring that your workers are using powerful new tools like this in a safe and, and trusted manner we want you know better business outcomes by enabling employees to use emerging tech, uh, but we need to know which ones they're using, how they're using them, and then how we can use digital adoption to put the guardrails around there to make sure they're being used in the most constructive and safest way. Right. So that's the kind of thing that we can do, and um, you know we, we can compare our actual investments versus what we're we're doing in terms of uh, a real utilization on the ground, and. <clears throat> Uh, having those metrics, as uh, Stephanie said it right, is having that uh, uh, that data give you untold power, uh, both ne to ne negotiate new contracts, as well as to actually help your stakeholders get what they need. Thanks, Dion. So going back to your point about applied observability, Walk Me Discovery is, is really, we believe, a critical capability to add to any a digital adoption platform. So those, those insights, that visibility that you can use to inform your software decisions, understand the usage patterns, optimize your spending, improve your user experience, all of that we see as, as one holistic view on technology strategy. So we're, we're, we're aiming to give customers that, that visibility with the context of the jobs that people are, are, are doing and how digital fits into those and a way to track your, your progress with digital adoption. So we're, we're ultimately, when we look at the offerings that are out there that customers have today that are helpful in making sure that you only pay for what you need, when you bring that into a digital adoption platform, ultimately that's now helping you get what you've paid for. So with that, Dion, Stephanie, thank you so much for being here today. This concludes the panel discussion portion of our webinar. And in just a moment, our guests will be joining us live to answer your questions. For our guests, if you haven't submitted yours yet, there's still time, so go ahead and do so now. Hi, everyone. So we're live. And uh, in just a moment, we'll we'll get to the questions that have come in. And I, I love these questions. If you haven't added yours yet, please go ahead and do. and. And welcome, Dion and Stephanie, to the, the live portion of the show. It's it's great to have you all here with us today. Um, so we'll spend the next 15 minutes or so go, going through these, these questions. And the first one I, I want to tee up for Dion. This is from Dennis. 
uh, Zajac, I hope I'm saying that okay. Uh, can you define, Dion, what you mean by digital transformation? Uh, as he points out, it's it's maybe obvious to some, but defined very differently by a lot of folks. Yeah, no, it's a great question and, and comes up quite a bit. And uh, mostly what we mean by digital transformation is, is something different than what we've been doing the last 30 or 40 years in our organizations, which is digitizing and automating our business using technology. So we've been taking how we work and we've been we've been translating it literally into digital tools. Uh, and we rethink it some, but digital transformations, uh, you know, more disruptive. It's about uh, king and reimagining portions of your business saying with the technology art of the possible, how can I uh, reach new markets? How can I create uh, new offerings and new services, new business models uh, using technology? And so we can do that just in you know how people work. We can do that to our customer experience. We can do that to our supply chain. But it, it should feel uh, like a, a fundamental rethinking of your organization or that that part of, of you know your department or whatever. So it, it's much more change oriented. And doing this, uh, it, uh, doing a successful digital transformation is a fairly high risk activity. And things like um, applied observability really help you understand what you're really doing and then how, what changes you're making and how effective they are. Thanks, Dion. Uh, the the next one I want to raise, and, and actually for Diane and Stephanie, I'd love to hear your perspectives on this. Does uh, this is from UV Kochar? Uh, does system utilization really correlate with business value and outcomes? What if the system usage reduces productivity? Uh, and I I, I just want to add that this is a, a question that walk me really. Uh, works around all the time, right? What is the right mix of productivity versus uh, efficiency, right? How, how much should an app be adopted versus, um, so I, I just wanna, uh, maybe Stephanie, could, could I hear your answer to the question first and then we'll go to Diane. First of all, what a great question. And it does, um, it, it, it does correlate to, you know, business success and it doesn't. Um, that's sorry, that's what I was trying to say, but um, that's what the data tells us. In my world, it's all about sales. Are we meeting revenue goals? Are our sellers hitting quota? Are they growing accounts? And is our company's footprint growing in key accounts? And so when I look at tech utilization and I realize that sellers are hitting their quota, they're meeting their goals without using specific platforms that were promised to make a difference, we can see that those aren't bringing business value and driving sellers there for no reason other than to get more users up just won't make a difference to that bottom line. So I think there's a lot to be said for just having that baseline of what is our goal, what's the current status, and will has this made a difference or has it not? And can we can we you know scrap that program? <laughs> yeah, and I would I would second what what, what Stephanie says it. It can correlate, uh, uh, you know, app utilization can correlate to productivity and, and sometimes it doesn't. You can do things that, that aren't being useful. And the trick is being able to look at the data and see the pattern and understand the correlation um, uh, and, and the difference. So we often measure things like logins uh, and then declare success. This, this application must be useful because people are logging into it versus are they actually doing things inside there that are then turning into, you know, things like conversions and increased sales. Uh, and so with uh, applied observability, you can actually see that. Thanks, Diana and Stephanie. So, uh, Stephanie, this this next one, I'm going to uh, start with with you as well. I, question from Daniel Peters. How would you sell walk me to a CIO in one conversation? Uh, what data do you think would make them really consider it? Wow, that is a big question. Um, I'd love to pull in a, an enterprise account manager for this. Um, I'm, I'm sure they would do a much better job than I would. But, you know, the gr one thing that I would just show with data is how WalkMe allows us to begin with that end goal in mind. It allows us to begin with the end goal at Cisco, which is empowering an inclusive future for all um, and helping the world become more sustainable, um, which is only done by growing our footprints on the counts. <laughs> So while beginning with that end in mind, when chatting with the CIO, I would just show that Cisco allows the CIOs to begin with that end in mind. 
um, but accelerate the rate at which we're able to really enable our sales team to reach those key performance indicators to grow accounts and to get us to that final outcome. And that's really done by baselining your programs. Um, one thing I've done is baseline and don't do anything else until you baseline current processes and current performance, because you have to have that data story to tell at the end to show your success. Otherwise, how did you make a bigger difference? You need that data. And so with um, the baseline and with looking at, and with using programs like Discovery and, and Walk Me Insights, you're really able to show the, the success of your programs. You're able to show the past state, you're able to show, you know, during, and then you're able to show that um, post event or post engagement state um, and make continue to make decisions based on that. So I would say that that's the power um, coming from the learning and development world. The only sort of metrics we have are how many people went to the training, who's rolling their eyes right now. I want to roll my eyes right now, but I'm trying to be professional. You know, how many people went to the training? Oh, we were so successful. We had thousands of people go through this training. Then what? <laughs> Did we meet quota? Were they able to actually execute the, the new workflows across their tech stack? Were they actually able to have conversations we wanted them to have with customers? And not only do a lot of times those, um, those learning and development teams not baseline, but they never have that follow through. I hate to say never, but it's almost impossible to have that follow through without the insights and data that you can get by observing and um, discovering um, employee experience in the flow of work. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, another another question that I think is directed at, at you and your your points about your experience with Cisco. How do you get such a large business to open up to new ideas? Uh, a, a department entrenched entrenched in last decade's ideas seems like it would be a difficult push. And uh, related question, but I think from someone else who would be the stakeholder for the approval of the deployment of discovery? So I think generally you've got relationships there where you can push forward these new ideas. Who are your business stakeholders that are a champion for, for what you're doing? Well, I was brought into Cisco specifically for these skills, specifically because there was that need, there was this gap. But while I had a vice president and a stakeholder who believed in it, but didn't quite understand, and I had a senior director who was just my absolute champion, you know, I came to Cisco on the first day and I was like, I'm here, everyone, don't worry. Um, but that wasn't the case. No one was waiting for me to revolutionize and disrupt their programs. These were all very experienced professionals. So it wasn't like I was able to go in and just change everything within my first couple of days. I think um, my senior director called it me being in uh, tummy time <laughs> and that tummy before I could crawl, before I could walk. And I thought I'd be flying by six months because that's the type of individual I am. But I think tummy time lasted well into nine months. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I think I'm out of tummy time. But one thing that I did notice is I started small and I really took a playbook out of my own a sales methodology to find that pain in the company. Like who hates doing something that could be alleviated with walk me who, you know, wasn't able to show the success of their most recent program who just had a program fail last quarter because they weren't able to drive reinforcement and adoption. And so finding those different teams and sneaking onto their calendar and setting things up and trying to gain this buy-in with the help of course of my, a uh, senior director who's a champion and my VP who had this larger vision that started opening up a little doors, but it's very slow at big companies. It's very slow at even small companies and everyone wants to see different proofs of concept. So my, my advice to you is to start small, do little things here and there that can drive as much impact as possible, you know, improving data quality, improving user experience to any degree, kind of smoothing the edges and removing the friction of different platforms and removing that pain that certain teams see, and you'll start to get buy-in. I'm definitely not an expert. I think I'm, I think I'm still in the crawl phase here at Cisco, um, but at least we're at a tummy time and, and um, the next step is to, to start walking. So it's, it's all possible with data though. Love the tummy time analogy, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Dion, here's a question uh, that I, I think you would have a great perspective on. So th the, the question is, if I can't get data about usage of several apps and tools inside a company, 
Can I collect it from another perspective? For example, with an automated questionnaire about what an employee is using or not and how much, et cetera. So the reason I, I like this question is I imagine there's got to be a lot of ways that people are trying to get visibility into their tech stack. So in your experience, you, you brought up the point about turning off applications just to see if people are using them. But what are what are some of the other methods that you've you've heard that people are, are doing to to try to get this visibility? Uh, yeah, well, uh, great question, Eric. I would just first uh, note that surveys are a notoriously unreliable way to, to get detailed uh, and, and up to date information about user behavior. Um, they often forget what they're, they're, they're doing. They may not accurately characterize it. Uh, and often the busiest uh, people don't even fill them out. So you don't really know what's going out. You know, the most the busiest and the most important people often don't fill them out. Uh, but yeah, we have a, a variety of relatively crude uh, strategies uh, we can use. Uh, you know, we can use uh, technical observability, you know, all those log files, as I talked about, and try and, and manually cobble together a picture that usually is it gets out of date pretty quickly. And so this is why I'm much more excited about things like discovery, which takes you a level above, brings all that data together, uh, allows you to see ground truth uh, in real time or near real time. And, and so th those crude methods are, you know, just they're not effective they're expensive they're laborious um and and so i you know i, I would i would recommend it moving to more advanced uh techniques that, that give us what you re we really need uh, to operate efficiently in it thanks dion all right so uh, we've got a question from angela so this is a a, a walk me specific question so i'll um, I'll, I'll take the first pass, but uh, is discovery different from walk me insights? And so uh, I would, I would say Angela, the way to look at it is walk me insights gives you that, that really deep double click into what's happening inside your specific application, right? So any, any application that you want to go and look at what are the pathways that, that people are taking the funnels, what's that journey look like? What's what are people interacting with in that application, and and how do you optimize those people's experiences with digital adoption? Right, insights is is really about getting deep into that application. Discovery is enabling the uh, let's say the the full visibility into what's happening across your organization. So it, it's it's not about any one specific application, but it's about how are people using this technology that your company has invested in? How can you drive the most efficiency from that, whether that's consolidating tools? There was a, a question or a comment from somebody about, uh, is, is there a way to enforce behavior of, hey, you should be using this survey tool instead of SurveyMonkey, or customers are, are constantly bringing up Hey, should they be using smart sheets or this other thing? I've got Stephanie pointed out chat GPT. Maybe I've got some other AI thing that I've licensed licensed within Salesforce. They should be using. So uh, understanding how people are using your technology stack, then being able to drive the full value of the software you've invested in or to find efficiencies so that you're only spending what you need. Um, so yeah, it's the discovery is the bigger picture and, and walk me insights is, is the zoom in. Um, but, but Stephanie, you have anything to add? You're one of our power data gurus. Well, one thing that really comes to mind is just that idea of being prescriptive. So for example, insights lets you know everything that's going on on platforms where walk me is deployed. But discovery adds that next level to of the employee experience. So programs like ChatGPT, where you do not have enterprise licenses for your company, but a lot of employees are going there. A lot of people are going there. And um, it just really allows you to say, this is the information we have and make informed decisions based on that type of data. So you could potentially grow your WalkMe platform or your WalkMe program to new platforms if needed. And you know that employee experience so that you can make decisions based on how many users are there, what type of resources would we need to support these amount of users on a new platform. 
and go to your leaders and request more funding that way. So I think that there's a really great um, opportunity to just be very data first in your digital adoption program to be able to prioritize your own programs and your own um, requests coming in from, I'm sure, all over the place to say we need to go into this platform next because we have the most users. They're going in weekly. They're going in daily. And we need to engage them and make sure that um, they're meeting performance and KPIs um, in, in that specific platform. So that, that, that what I say is the difference. We also, um, we're lucky enough at Cisco to have an enterprise license. So for our specific amount of users, we can continuously add platforms as our tech stack grows. And so I would have people ask me, oh, just put Walk Me on this platform so we can just start getting insights into it and look at user behavior because um, we're not able to work with the vendor very well or the, the team is too busy and we need this information in our enablement organization. And now um, with you know, discovery, we don't have to, you know, fully deploy walk me yet, we can wait, we can observe, and then we can make that decision later on. But it's just incredible to have that really built in um, to be able to make those decisions. Thanks so much, Stephanie. All right. So next question. Um, given that the data we are discussing is essentially user behavior, Please elaborate on how user rights are ensured in terms of data measurement not becoming invasive or the data becoming accessible to third parties. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually, I'll, I'll take this one. So uh, this is a, this is a, a customer enablement op opportunity with discovery in that the customer has the, the full ability to define all the policies around whatever data they're they're collecting and you know that's part of walkley's foundation in general um so the you know it's it's really in the customer's hands um you know we we employ uh state-of-the-art encryption and, and security methodologies um that are you know enterprise level fed ramp certified Etc. So it's you know we we really we provide the tools for our customers to to do the the data privacy uh, policies and then but we also enable them to collect the right right level of data that they want to know about their application usage and you know what I've what I've learned by working with a lot of customers and and their IT leadership is that this the level of data that we provide is already accessible by all of your first party applications anyway, right? And so it's just about more so who in your organization should have the uh, the permissions to view that kind of data. And, and, and we wrap our policies around that as well, in, ensuring that only the the right people that, that need to see any type of data about application usage are the ones that, that have those permissions. So I also I see a follow up question from uh, from Dennis uh, Zajak. So um, can you can, please elaborate on the extent to which you have been able to link system usage data with with business outcomes? Uh, can you provide some examples of how system usage is measured? So uh, I, I want to frame this up maybe for Dion. Um, you, we hear from customers that they invest in technology because they see some sort of return that they want to happen or that they want to see for their business, like more revenue or more collaboration leading to innovation, et cetera. So how, how would you say, you know, if you were talking to a CIO or IT leader looking to invest in an application, how would you say they should measure utilization towards a business outcome like that? Well, it, it, what's nice about uh, today's uh, design of applications is, is that we do have a good sense of what the user journey is, uh, what we intend them to do with the applications, and we can identify key activities that result in our outcomes. Like, like in a, a CRM system, we can see when an opportunity is, is turned into a sale, for example. Uh, so there are states in the system that we can measure, um, and, and we can tie uh, upstream behavior to that uh, to uh, getting reaching that outcome, you know, so users that use an application a certain way or use certain features get things done faster. Maybe they reach that point quicker. That results in more productivity. 
But usually we understand the states that we're trying to drive towards, as you're mentioning, uh, Eric. And we can mention, we can measure those, and then we can look for patterns that lead to those behaviors quicker or faster, or, or more efficiently, or, or whatever. So, um, most of the time, businesses understand the outcomes, and they also understand how they can get their applications to reach those outcomes, especially if they can see data that allows them to optimize that process. Appreciate it. And I, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of product specific questions coming in, so I'm also. Uh, multitasking over here as well. Um, if I could add one thing to that last comment about finding those, um, mapping those business outcomes. Um, for example, this is really applicable at Cisco right now because we're moving to new sales processes to sell more recurring revenue as opposed to more hardware, which is what Cisco traditionally sells. And with that goal of selling more software, more services along with hardware is the the need to shorten our selling cycles to shorten the time spent in each um each you know crm stage um and really we brought in lots of tools lots of ai platforms that promise they say if your seller does this then uh, um, opportunities will be de-risked and your selling cycles will be shorter and so looking and seeing at who is we want to keep them honest and we want to say, actually, our sellers did go in here. Every single one of them who completed these tasks within the end use the, the AI platform were able to shorten their selling cycles. So I think there's lots of opportunities there. I think that a lot of times we just see that bottom line, but there's really ways to reverse engineer those outcomes and find those KPIs along the way that really do show that success everywhere from, you know, prospecting with sales, um, um, the different sales navigator platforms and Zoom Info and those platforms, all the way up to um, those conversations that you have with customers and how your customer success is managing their accounts and their opportunities and their renewals. So really working with different teams and having those role specific KPIs can really help you map those to those outcomes. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Diane. Uh, so unfortunately, that's really all the time that we have for today. And, and we, we didn't get a chance to respond to all the questions, but truly appreciate the participation of, of the crowd. I, I love the comments here. Um, I, I believe that we're going to drop some info into the chat here momentarily uh, where you can go and, and request the uh the opportunity to learn more about about discovery get a demo etc and you know we really hope that you feel a little bit more prepared today uh, for the the future of enterprise tech so again thank you dion and stephanie for joining us and, and taking the time to to talk to our audience the, this recording is is going to be available on demand and sent to everybody's emails. Uh, but again, big thanks to Stephanie and, and Diane for joining today. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you.